so much, Chris. I appreciate that. And, you know, I want to ask you a question today as, we, as we're exiting the Christmas season, coming to 2020. Please do not miss next week because I never disclose until the message. I have a theme message next week. Every year we have a theme message. And the person who wants to win $50 is going to tell me what was the theme last year. Well, I can see it had an impact on your life, and uh, we'll talk about that. Well, there's, you, you don't get to go home and look it up, and I'll let you know more about that next week, but you're going to have to wait there. But I want to ask you a question. As we leave this season, I don't want you to forget the manger. Am I getting, are you getting that pop here, Chris, that I'm getting on this? Am I, are we just, am I, we're better if I pulled out a little bit. Sound okay to you guys? Well, let's get on with it. But I, I don't want you to forget the manger in so often we can forget what does Christmas really mean? Now, I'm not going to make this a big thing, but I want to give you a little test here. Uh, what's more important, Jesus or Christmas trees? Jesus. What's more important? I'm just kind of curious what you're going to say here. The gifts that we get at Christmas and that we exchange or knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I want to ask you this question. How many of you would believe me if I, said, if I would tell you a lot of children may be confused as to the real meaning of Christmas? Regardless of your upbringing, regardless of the warm fuzzies you get, regardless of when your nostrils are filled with the beautiful scent of gingerbread houses, I just want you to just think for a second and ask, is it possible we ever forget the manger? Is it possible you ever forget the baby? Let's remember, the scripture says, do you not know that your body is the temple of God? Holy Spirit dwells within you. Think of that. You are what's called a sukkah. A sukkah literally means you are a booth. You are this portable, like a tent, a dwelling place. Isn't it interesting to note that the children of Israel in October, they celebrate, it's usually the end of September, early October, they, um, uh, uh, Sukkot is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. That's when they celebrate uh, the fact that, of when they thought the Messiah would come to the earth. Well, what makes that fascinating to me is the Bible says, and the word became a temple. The word became a sukkah. The word became a dwelling place, or a uh, better way to put it, a tent among us, and dwelt among us. That's Jesus coming to earth. So the first thing we need to realize, Jesus would have been born probably around October, and is that a big thing? How many of you know every day is a good day to celebrate the birth of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus? So I don't want to make that the issue. But what I want to ask you is this, in your life today, do you really have a deep, passionate understanding of this gift of eternal life when Jesus first came to earth? Uh, you know, when I first accepted, well, let me ask you this question. How many of you remember where you were at when you first accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Denise, where were you? In the church? Do you remember what year it was? Uh, 1979. Is this your final answer? Do you want to call a friend? <laughs> Lifeline? Okay, 79. Mm -hmm. And I believe for you it was very impactful. Very impactful. Who else remembers where you were? Where were you? I was in the church that Bill had introduced me to in 1983. What, what, what church was it? The church of today. Hey, I grew up in a real cool African-American neighborhood, and so the name of the church where I got saved was the church of what's happening now, bro. But anyway, that's not really true, but that, I, I just think that'd be such a cool name. I think it'd be such a cool name. But I remember where I was at, when it happened, how it happened. How many of you were brought up in the church, and being a Christian kind of runs in the family. It happened. You're not exactly sure when it happened. Come on, raise your hand. Nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, and that's okay. And we're jealous of you. You know, if you've kept your passion for Jesus and you love Jesus, that ain't a bad thing. 
But we all remember these things. But let me tell you what's kind of interesting for me. From age 10 to 16, as you know, I was a child actor, and so I was only in school for a few weeks out of that time. I had a private tutor. I had this little book I had to fill out with all the answers in the back of the book. And, of course, I never, ever would have looked to the back of the book to find the answers as a non-Christian. It wasn't the best form of education. But I remember um, what took place. All of a sudden, I went from being the only student in my class to a school of 4,500 students. Trisha was Homewood Flossmoor High School, which was right down the street from Homewood Full Gospel Church. And uh, I remember I went there and I hated school. I didn't want to be there. Because when you've had a tutor and you just fill in the blanks and all of a sudden you're in real classes with real science labs and real math, it can rob your joy. And I remember when I was there, there was a class. I wanted to get out of school as quick as possible. I knew I was going to go to college, and then I wanted to go to law school. So all of a sudden, here I am, and there was a class, and I knew this was for me. God created this class for me. It was called Independent Reading. Doesn't that sound great? You read a book, and then you do a book report. Well, I was really into sports, and so I read the story on Bob Gibson, the, the, uh, the pitcher for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. I read the book on uh, the Jackie Robinson story. I mean, I read book after book, and I did all these things, and I, had to do, I didn't realize there was one more book report to go in order to get my grade. And um, so there was this book there. It was called Run, Baby, Run. Well, I just finished reading about Gates Brown and Ron LaFleur, who are both individuals who served prison time, and the Detroit Tigers actually took them as, they, 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 they were paroled to the Detroit Tigers, and they became great players there. And how many of you know Detroit's a great place if you're coming out of prison to go? But anyway, so how many, who's from Detroit here? Anyone? Anyone from Detroit? I could tell. But anyway, so... Um, here, here I was in, 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 um, in this class, and I'm going, oh, Run Baby Run is probably about some gang banger, because that was about a gang, some guy from a gang who turned his life around. And I said, you know what? This is a great book. This is probably a guy who then went on to become a professional, uh, he played for a professional sports team. I just didn't know what sport it was yet. So I'm reading the book, and there's some guy named David Wilkerson, who's so conservative he dies his Easter eggs white out of the Assemblies of God. And he leads this gangbanger out of Harlem, New York, this Puerto Rican guy, to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I'm Jewish, and I'm going, I don't need this book. What's this doing in a secular school? And I was kind of ticked off. But the book captured my heart. And I read the book, and I'm 16 and a half, and I finish the book, and I'm weeping uncontrollably. I'm just weeping. And I'm thinking, I'm a Jew. Jews do not believe in Jesus. We believe in Hashem, the name. We believe in El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. We believe in Yahweh Rofecha, the God who heals. Yahweh Nisi, God who's our banner. I mean, we believe in God, but not Jesus. That's like another God. That's idolatry. But I read the book, and I couldn't, I couldn't get over it. So I left my parents' condominium, I, though, though I, I lived in the same home my whole life, and all the, the other kids, my sister was gone, my brother was gone, and um, so here, I, she was 15 years older, Bob's five and a half years older than me, and I read the book, and I'm just saying, what am I going to do? It's three o'clock in the morning, and there's a strip mall right outside of our home, and there was a Dr. Pepper can right there in the beginning of the stri strip mall, and it was a diet Dr. Pepper, like, what's the point, right? Anyway, it was silver and blue, and I smashed the can, and I started kicking it. And I said, Hashem, the name. That's the name Jews call God. Hashem, if you're really God, if I really need someone to die for my sins, show me. If Jesus is really your son, you're going to have to show me because as a Jew and family members who were survivors of the Holocaust, to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior was like joining the other team, joining kind of the Hitler team. That's how Jews looked at it. And I'm going, man, what do I do with this thing? Because I really felt something inside. Well, I kind of buried it for the next three years. But I remember when finally a guy named Bob Antoinette told me, the Lord will show signs and wonders to the unbelievers, to the skeptic, to the cynic, 
to the person who's struggling with this. So I prayed two prayers. A lot more happened, but this is a very abbreviated testimony. I said, Lord, if you're really Jesus, or if Jesus is really Lord, to be more specific, I said, I'd like to see some other Jews get saved in my family. Now, how many Jews do you think I ever saw get saved in my whole life? One. My cousin, his last name, Bloom, my mother's generation. When he accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, his family had a funeral for him. They literally buried a coffin in the ground, and they said three times, my son is dead to me, my son is dead to me, as they took shovels of dirt and rock and put it. And you know this really happens, Mike, you're Jewish, and you understand this. And I'm going, I, this, this just can't happen. I don't know what to do. And so I was so overwhelmed by the reality and the potential of what happens if Jesus is Lord. Can I search, do I choose Jesus or my parents? Jesus or my siblings? Jesus and all my connections and the people that I grew up with, I was definitely overwhelmed. But here's the reality. Somebody said, the Lord will show signs and wonders to the non-believer. So I said, you know, Lord, I'm a believer. I still think I'm a believer. If you're really Lord, I want to see other Jews in my life get saved. I've only seen one in all those years, in 19 years. Within the next 11 days, my roommate in college, Marty, a Jew, he's a doctor today, gets saved. His brother, Bob, a teacher, gets saved. His brother, George, gets saved. Dickie Warren, who was a great friend and a drummer in a band in the area, his father was an OBGYN, completely Jewish, he got saved, independent of all these other guys. Then Warren Engelberg, he was the guy who was the drug dealer to my other friends over there. He got saved. And then Marty's mother, Adele Braxton, and her husband get saved. So I said, Lord, if you are really Jesus... Or if Jesus is really Lord, there's one more thing I have to see happen. I grew up in a family where my father had no trust for his father. He will tell you himself, he hated his father. I've been allowed to share this story publicly with my dad's permission. Um, my, my grandfather was not one of the good people. He came from Belarus, Minsk, uh, former Soviet Union, and he raped both of his daughters. He beat my father. My father was radically abused. My father left home at 15 years of age. He supported himself by teaching guitar lessons, waiting tables in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and he got accepted at 16 years of age into the University of Illinois, where he got his undergraduate degree, and he got his master's degree in business. But my dad will have, would have nothing to do with his father. So here's what happens. I said, Lord, if you are real, I want to see my father visit his father in Drexel Retirement Home in Chicago, Illinois. I prayed that prayer on a Tuesday. Never gave it a second thought because how many of you know there's certain prayers you pray? Like, Lord, I want to be a star on the Los Angeles Lakers. How many know there's just certain prayers you don't think about them again because it just ain't gonna happen. This is an impossibility. I don't care how great God is. I mean, my dad's heart, well, he's got a free will and he had a hard heart towards his father and I understand. But I called home on a Saturday because my dad, would, dad, dad and I would always, we had a standing date every Saturday. I would drive home from college 90 miles for this date because he paid. And that uh, for the gas and for the food, we'd go to Al's kosher Jewish delicatessen. I shouldn't do this to you at almost 12 o'clock. We're going to have a hot corned beef on rye. Sometimes we'd add pastrami because, you know, life's too short not to live it up a little. And then there'd be a nice kosher pickle, hot mustard. Does it sound good to any of you? Then once in a while, I decided I'm going to have a Nova Scotia lox and bagel sandwich. And then have the pickles and everything else. And my mom said, I don't think you're going to be going anywhere with your dad today. I said, what do you mean? She said, he got up this morning, and the craziest thing happened, Billy. My mother always called me Billy. I said, my name is Pastor. No, I didn't say that to her. <laughs> like, that would have flown, right? And, and, and so I said, Mom, where is he? 
He got up and said, I have to go see Sam. He never called his dad dad. I have to go see Sam. There's just something inside of me that says, I don't know how much longer he's going to live. I have to go see him. He's in Drexel retirement home seeing his father that he doesn't call father, that he calls Sam. Yeah. Isn't that weird? How many of you would think at that point I should get a clue and get saved? But I said, Lord, if you're really God, and then I stopped. And that was Saturday, but on that Tuesday, March 14th, 1977, at a place called Second Coming Ministries, a little white house next to Rich South High School, I said, I can't do this alone. Jesus this is a one-time decision. I'll never change it. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And like one of my favorite gospel songs we sing, I will never be the same again. It was that powerful. It was that incredible. When this salvation happened, I felt like the Ethiopian eunuch. I'm not a eunuch, but I felt like the Ethiopian eunuch. And I said, I got to get baptized. It's 45 degrees in Chicago with a wind chill factor of 28 degrees. And the guy said, well, you can get baptized next Sunday. There's a church we're related to, and we'll see if you can actually do it during one of their morning services. No, I have to get baptized tonight. There's something inside of me. And the neighbors have a pool right next door. I said, you'll get pneumonia. I said, God heals. I said, I have to get baptized. How many of you know when you get baptized in a pool, when it's 45 degrees, 28 degree wind chill factor, your testimonies are always very short? <laughs> and I went in there, and a Baptist preacher, Clem, he said, and now, based on your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to get you to look beyond Beautiful buildings, major programs. I'd like to think decent, sometimes maybe even great sermons, no matter who the pastor might be. I, I want you to think of a time, before we had these ornate and beautiful buildings, I want you to think of a time when worship really wasn't that powerful. We'd come to church, it was folksy. It was simplistic. Almost every song was in G, C, and D, or D, and A, and I don't remember, but pretty simple, if you will. I mean, it was like almost going to children's church. Here we would get together with all these young people, and there'd be hundreds of us and sometimes thousands of us, and I'm not kidding you, in a Sunday morning worship service, and any of you grew up like this, we would do things like, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. How many of you ever went to a church where adults sing songs like that too? I am one of them. And by the time you're through, you get you, nauseam. You're going, I've had many sons. Right arm, left arm, head up, head down, turn around. Father Abraham had many sons and many sons. I mean, it was crazy. Then we'd, we had all these hand motions. We'd go, he that believeth, he that believeth, have everlasting life. He that believeth on the Father and the Son, have everlasting life. I got the tune way off on that one. When I get, when I get to heaven, gonna walk all around, have everlasting life. Gonna sit by my Savior, gonna put on my crown, have everlasting life. I mean, we did the craziest things. We go, I got the joy, 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 down in my heart. Where? And I mean, and we'd sing these songs, but we were like kids, just loving Jesus. And then for worship, <clears throat> we were gatherized. We would sing songs like, Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Guys, it was hokey, but it was so meaningful. Master, Savior, I used to go to Frank Zappa concerts, Chicago concerts, Jethro Tull concerts, Cream concerts. I saw the Rolling Stones live, like the fragrance after the rain. Then we go to, for he is Lord, he is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. On my knees I'll bow. And 
here you had all these folks from rock and roll background, from jazz background, from blues background. We used to go watch B.B. King play at the Jazz Showcase in Chicago. Who remembers for the money? Raise your hand, don't yell it out. What was B.B. King's guitar's name? Lucille. That's right. You knew that, Chris, right? Did you know it because I told you before or you knew it? Okay, then you knew that. Very good. But friends, we've come a long way. Don't miss this message today from the manger. Maybe we've come too far from the manger. There's nothing wrong, friends, with the development we see in the church today. I thank God for lighting systems and sound systems, and I thank God for beautiful buildings, and I thank God for thermostat-controlled air conditioning and heat and all the other blessings. I'm not saying that's a negative thing. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying professionalism isn't great. The name Elohim is God who is the creator, and it says we are created in his image. Therefore, we are called to be a creator creative people too, but the question is, would you still come to church if it was 110 degrees outside without air conditioning? Would we still come to church if the heat wasn't working, when it gets super cold here, like 61 degrees? I'm wondering, would we still come to church if we didn't have all of the, shall I say, bells and whistles? It's wonderful to have a world-class building. How many of you are thankful for our building right here? I'm grateful. Friends, I was grateful for a 3,000-seater world-class. I mean, think of this. Our lighting and sound system was over a quarter million dollars. But how many of you think we can have all the bells and whistles and yet not have Jesus? The key is to not forget what was really in the manger. The key is to just take a moment and ask yourself this question, even if we have all the bells and whistles, even if we have all the musical instruments, even if we have the world-class worship, even if we have all the benefits, civilities, amenities of a world-class church, what if the manger is empty? Remember I told you last week I was just in Cabo, San Lucas, and part of the Catholic tradition in Mexico is they don't put Jesus in the manger until the 24th of December. I honestly thought somebody stole Jesus. Where's Jesus? But I want you to think of your heart. I want you to think of that stable. Just another temple. Just another tabernacle. I want you to imagine what would it be like if we had all the wise men who actually didn't show up for another 18 months if we had all the benefits, if we had all the beautiful things that can happen in the manger, even no room in the inn, and yet there was no Jesus in the manger of our heart, how would that change things? Here's our big idea. Christmas serves to remind us to not forget the baby. Watch this. When I first met Jesus, the environment I worshipped him in was irrelevant. How many of you, now this will make you old now, if you admit to this, how many of you have ever been to church in a tent? How many of you have ever been in a sawdust tent? We're talking back in the days of Oral Roberts and Catherine Kuhlman or maybe Amy Simmel McPherson. We could talk about all the different names. How many of you have ever been in one of those revival type environments without any of the comforts, the creature comforts? What would happen today if all of a sudden we lost our creature comforts, if you will? You see, friends, I mentioned to you when I spoke in Argentina, and even more so in El Carmen, in Monterrey, Mexico, with uh, Victor and Ruth Martinez. Friends, I was in churches that here we would see the 80 to 90 people, and I'm not exaggerating. In some of these services, people would be standing shoulder to shoulder, they couldn't even sit down, and you'd have four, 450 people. They'd take all the chairs out. Thank God the fire marshal wasn't there. And they just wanted to worship the Lord. The time in Argentina, and I was speaking for 11 hours, that it was freezing outside. The place was jam-packed and going eight, nine deep. All these people looking through these windows, just trying to get a sense of what God might want to do in their life. How far have we gotten from the 
uncomfortable, undesirable, shall I say, archaic or antiquated manger? Would you still show up? Would you still be willing to pursue the Christ? Today in churches, the climate control has to be perfect. My friends, some, and I, please, I'm not putting anyone down. Ladies, when you're freezing, we men are sensitive to you because you're always freezing at home too. I remember when Marge and I first got married, I, I remember one day I put my, my, my foot on her leg there and I couldn't get it off for three months. It was like the butterball turkey. She was freezing there, you know what I'm saying? How many, how many of you ladies are cold wherever you go, you know? How many of you men are always too warm? And it, and it can go the other way as well. But here's the question. Many churches, I've had people tell me, if you don't do something about the air conditioning, something about the heat, I can't stay here any, any, any longer. The worship has to cater to my lifestyle. I'm just curious. How many of you have a style of worship you prefer? I, should, I certainly do. How many of you, come on, how many of you have musical taste? Nothing wrong with that. But what would have happened if the angels... When they said, glory, on, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth. What would have happened if they rapped it instead of saying it? What would have happened if Lin-Manuel Miranda, who wrote uh, in, the, in, in the Heights and also uh, Hamilton, all of a sudden it was a rap? Or how many of you love country and western music? God can save you. <laughs> I... How many of you understand country music concerns me? It's always such a sad theme. I backward mask all of my country music so I can get my pickup back, my wife back, and, you know. <laughs> you know, guys, somewhere along the line, though, I've had people say, it's got to be my style of worship. It's got to be the kind of children's ministries I want. It has to have all the ministries that cater to me. The preaching and the teaching, it has to be my style. I wonder, when we come to church... How concerned is Jesus with the worship and the teaching being to your style? Is it possible maybe he wants to inspire us, he wants to instigate us and provoke us to good works that we might want to tell other people to taste and see that the Lord is good, that we might get other people to share their faith as well? Write this down. Christmas serves to remind us to what? Christmas reminds us to not forget the baby. See, friends, it is so easy for me to replace the manger for a comfortable mansion. I love the scripture. In my father's house are many. Did you know that doesn't even use the word mansion in the Greek? It's rooms. Rooms. I have a special word from God. Mine will be a mansion, but I don't know about yours. That was a joke. Some of you are concerned, okay? Who knows? But so often we get away from the sawdust floor and the tent and the inconvenience and the lack of climate control, if you will, and, and, and there's something inside of us where we want better and I understand that, and it's nice to have better, but I'm wondering, have we lost the manger? Or when I was in Mexico, Jesus was missing from the manger. But think of this. You look at Israel. How many times have I told you this? 20, for 20 years, the Israelites took the Ark of the Covenant into battle. Now, what did the Ark of the Covenant, what did it represent? You saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know. What did it represent? The presence of God. And they brought it with them into battle, and the Philistines stole it from them, and it was missing for 20 years. And so for 20 years, there's no God. There's no presence of God. Now, the Philistines got in a lot of trouble for what they did, but to the holy of holies, is which were, where you place the Ark of the Covenant, it was empty. People still, they would hallel, they'd jump up and down and turn around and act foolishly clamors. They would baruch the Lord, they'd get on their knees and they'd worship him. They would lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting, and they would yada, they tow to the Lord, which means just with thanksgiving they'd lift up their hands, and with yada they would praise the Lord. I mean, they did all these wonderful things except one problem. God wasn't there. There was a time Jacob said, God was in this place and I didn't even know it. The problem here is God wasn't in the place and they didn't even know it. 
I would rather join Avraham. Who's Avraham? Very good. Abraham. At a stone altar. Wherever he went, he always made an altar to the Lord. And see God worship. See God in worship. Then go worship in an empty tabernacle. How many of you think there could be churches today? Places today? Groups of people today? who can get together in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. They can get together with the Ruach HaKadosh, so they think the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and find out later on, God was not even present. Just a question, is that possible? Is that really possible? Do we really believe that? Christmas serves to remind us to not forget the baby. I remember these old days, and I promise you, you're going to get some scripture here. And it's really a short message. I remember all-night prayer meetings. Have you ever been in an all-night prayer meeting? Are there times you go, what's the point? How can I do it? I remember with my interns, and I had 15 of them early on in Homewood, Illinois, we all felt compelled to just seek the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may yet still be found. And um, it was the funniest thing. So Dan Turner was my intern for children's ministries. The other guy, George Asia, was there. He was doing our youth ministry, all these different things. And we're at um, Dan's future wife's home, Karen Turner, an apartment. And here you've got about 45 of us all over this apartment that couldn't have been more than 700 square feet, if that. And I mean, and we're on our knees and we're worshiping the Lord. We're praising him with our understanding. We're praising him in the spirit. And Elvin, you can appreciate this kind of environment. It was really cool. And these guys were into it. Dan had his rear end up in the air, his head in the carpet, and he's just praying and weeping and worshiping. And at three o'clock in the morning, I hear this. That is called praying in the spirit. But anyway, I don't think so. But you know what? Here's the key. There was something. We were back in an earthy place. We were back in the manger, in this rustic environment. We didn't have budgets. We didn't have world-class worship. We we didn't have these well-thought-out messages, though we were into the Word. We just had a heart to get with the animals, to get with the stench, to just get earthy. Nobody worried about who had deodorant on and who didn't have deodorant. Friends, we had people with holes in their pants, and it wasn't fashionable back then. We had individuals that were just wearing shorts, and we're talking about in the winter, and they just wanted to seek the Lord. I just want to get back to the manger. The wise men never made it to the manger, but they'll eventually find Jesus. But there's something about I'm willing to pursue him in the desert. I'm willing to pursue him in a place that's unprecedented for a Messiah to be. How many of you remember the door-to-door witnessing? Did anybody, did, am I the only one who went through that? How many of you remember the days where the Jehovah Witnesses weren't the only ones going door-to-door? And we were pounding on doors and leading people to Jesus. And this is how we built our youth group and how we built the church. Where am I going with this message today? I promise you. Some were good. Some were important. Then one day my pastor calls me into his office. I'd just been there a few months. Walter Peterson. He Americanized the name to Peterson. And he said, Bill, I know you're in law school. I know you're busy. But I want you and Marge, who I think you're going to marry someday. I said, how can you know that? He said, I think you're going to marry her. It's almost like they looked at me as a pity case. You know what I'm saying? A charity case. Like... Dude, she's four foot 11. I mean, you ain't ever gonna find something this good again. This is the one for you. But he, they, they loved Marge. I mean, come on, don't you love Marge? Come on, let's admit it. You all put up with me because of Marge. I get it, here we are. And so he says, Bill, I want you and Marge to teach our fifth grade Sunday school class. And I'm thinking, I don't do fifth grade Sunday school classes. That's not my calling. But guess what? That's where I learned to do gospel illustrations. That's where I was prepared to become a children's pastor. God knew what he was doing. And in those days, it was so weird. Did any of you grow up in this era? Back then, if my pastor told me he needed me, I just did it. I know it sounds crazy, almost sounds cultic or what have you. And he became my spiritual dad. And eventually, I would serve under him 
for eight years. It was so manger-like, if you will, then all of a sudden, Walter Peterson says, you're going to be on my staff full-time before you know it, but you need to leave for a couple years. I didn't feel the love. Like, you want me to leave? He said, a prophet has no honor in his own home. I think you need to go somewhere else for a couple years. And all of a sudden, missionaries are in our church. I don't know if you remember Gary and Carol Hall. Missionaries to Liberia. Any of you know them? Really cool people. Salt of the earth people. Marge and I had just gotten through praying. We used to kind of hang out in mangers. We still remembered the baby in the manger. Jesus not just on the cross, but resurrected from the cross. There was such a confidence that whatsoever he saith unto me, I should do it because whatsoever he says he can do, he will do. He's able to do things exceedingly and abundantly above anything I could ask or think. And so here we are, and <clears throat> Marge's parents were freaking out. She's going to marry an American, potentially, who happens to be Jewish, not Mennonite, and then reproduce Jumanite kids. I mean, they were a little bit freaked out. And we prayed, Lord, open up a door out west for me to get to know her parents. And all of a sudden, the next day, Gary Hall calls. Bill, I went to Bible college in California, an Assemblies of God school, with a guy named Jack Becker. He needs a youth pastor, and I know you're the guy. I'm thinking, I've just been a Christian for two years. I don't want to be a youth pastor. He says, you read the Bible through every three months. He says, you just have to trust me on this. This is a God thing. Have you ever thought about moving out west? If you haven't, then let, let's let it go. I'm going, we just prayed this prayer yesterday. So I stopped praying with Marge after that. <laughs> All of a sudden, we're in Ontario, Oregon, and God did an unprecedented work there. It was incredible. And eventually, we ended up back where we were supposed to be. But I no sooner get to Ontario, Oregon, there was an organization in Weezer, Idaho, only 30 minutes from our church. Listen to this name carefully now. It was called the First Aryan Church of Jesus Christ. How many of you understand there's a little problem with that when you're the only Jew in town? The First Aryan, and they believed Hitler was a great man, and in the church they had a picture of Jesus, and next to him, a picture of Hitler. How many of you know that's not where I spent my summer vacation? I'm going... Wow. And I mean, and they tried to get me out of town. And Marge and I knew we were supposed to be there. Now they made a big mistake. They sent a letter from Weezer, Idaho. And Bob, you understand this, that went across state lines by arriving in Ontario, Oregon. So at that point, local police no longer handle it. Now it's the FBI starring Ephraim, Ephraim Symbolist Jr. back in the days. And the FBI got involved and they shut the church down. But we were supposed to be exactly where we were at. But guys, this church, we rented a mall. We were in a mall. It was really kind of a cool thing. Everybody could bring their coffee to church, and you could hang out and have your donut during church, and no matter how unspiritual you think it is, God did such a work. I'm just wondering, how far have we gotten from the manger? How far have we gotten from the simplicity of the Christ child. Now, there's very important scriptures I have to share, but here it is. No matter how big the building, how populated the congregation, how high-tech the sound system might be, and how professional the ministry, friends, we can never lose sight of a way in a manger. No, no crib for his head. We must always have a, a manger that's still present. When people walk in off the street, they still have to see the simplicity of Christ. There's your manger instead of the complexity of our programs and the complexity of our systems and the complexity of our buildings. And please don't misunderstand. I think this is wonderful. But what's our priority? So here's what I want to leave you with today. How do we maintain a manger mentality. The manger, how many of you agree it's earthy? This ain't a flower factory, guys. It stinks. This is a stable. This is not where you expect to see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is not where you would expect to have this convergence between eternity, heaven, and earth. How do you maintain a manger mentality? Write these down quickly. 
Fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher or the author and perfecter of our faith. Isn't it interesting the Bible says that we are living epistles known and read of all men, living letters? Jesus is writing a story about you right now. He's actually writing a story about him right now, and he's saying, I am the author, I am the finisher of your faith. In fact, I'm working in your life both to will and to do of my good pleasure. So, we used to sing this song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. If Jesus is our primary focus, we can't go wrong. Jesus is our true, what? North. Number two, if we want to really have this manger mentality, if we don't want to forget the baby, this is so important, say no to idols. Do you have any idols? Just think about it. How many of you here think you've ever worshipped an idol before? Oh, come on. Don't you remember, guys, when you first met her? You idolized her. Do any of you remember that sports team that enamored you, captured your heart? Friends, it could be the love of money, which is the root of all evil. Idols are still very, very present, if you will. Anything you put before Jesus is an idol. So, anytime I focus is not on Jesus, it's on an idol. How many of you knew that? It's on an idol. Now look at this. Buildings, prosperity, pastors can all become idols. America's got talent. America loves idols. It can be a sports figure. It can be pro-fake wrestling. It, 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 it can be the bottom line of your 401k if you've got one. Listen to Deuteronomy 5, verse 8 through 9. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth, beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And I'm here to say there's something that happens when angels look at this. <laughs> Think about it if you're an angel. Angels are used to seeing splendor, glory, way beyond Ritz-Carlton, and now they're seeing a manger, a stable. The shepherds, they're going, this doesn't fit with my understanding of what Jesus looks like and where Jesus would be born and how this would work. So we have to learn to say no to idols. Number three, serve others. Matthew 23, 11. The greatest among you will be your servants. Friends, you want to come back to that manger mentality? Do you know the real problem with the inn? The Ritz-Carlton Inn? No room in the inn? They didn't want to serve the Messiah. Serving has a way of keeping us from thinking higher of ourselves than we ought to. Let me give you an insight. I really believe this. We are the most like Jesus when we're serving others. How many of you have people in your life that are difficult to serve because they just expect it? Come on. Tell the truth. Shame the devil. Guess what? Serve them anyway. Serving tends to bring us back to our basics. You want to maintain that manger mentality? How many of you understand I'm not against nice churches, nice buildings? I am not against you having money. I'm not against a nice car. What does the Bible say? Help me. Um, <clears throat> Matthew 6, let me try. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Just first. God doesn't care what you search, seek second. Oh! <gasps> But it could be pornography. Just hear me out. But it could be drugs. I said, God doesn't care what you seek second. Because if you seek Jesus first, whatever you seek second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, etc., will be right on time, right on track. That, I, I don't, I, I'm not afraid of too much television. 
I'm not afraid of movies. I'm not afraid of, might I drink too much? <gasps> if I can just get you to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the things you need will be added unto you and everything else will take care of itself. Let me tell you in the church where we really screwed up. We're so busy. You can't do this and you can't go there and you can't say that and you can't be this. And... But we forgot something more important. You need Jesus. Just seek Jesus first. His righteousness, it all takes care of itself. Uh, number four, and the last one, always maintain a personal altar. I want to ask you a question. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. How many of you know the Lord is near right now? He can be found right now. In fact, we're supposed to have a heart that follows hard after him. As the deer, you know, pants for the water, that's how our soul is supposed to long passionately for him. Everything else will take care of itself. But here's the key. We have to have a personal altar. If when you come to church, the only time you're hearing the word is when I'm sharing it with you, you'll always be behind the eight ball. You'll never get traction. There'll never be progress. When's the last time you've sat down with your spouse and said, man, let's get in the word. Let's pray together. Well, I'm not, I'm not comfortable. The reason you're not comfortable is you're not seeking the Lord first. I promise you, you seek him first, he'll take care of himself. And if you don't desire to do that today, don't worry. It's no big thing. Just say, Lord, I don't desire to do this thing with my wife that I'm supposed to do. So, Lord, will you give me the desire to desire to do this? And he'll get you there. How many believe it's God's will for you to have a personal altar, a place where you meet with God? You know what? The only difference between Abraham, it's a big one, and Lot. Nowhere in Scripture does nephew Lot ever have an altar. So he goes for stuff, he goes for things, he, go, he, he, he becomes a member of, of, of a godless nation, gets involved in their political and religious structure, horrible things happen, and then, oh, the, the, his lineage, it's, it's just a mess. But watch this. Abraham always had an altar. Just took a few rocks, just got on his knees, made a sacrifice, and worshiped the Lord. See, friends, Abraham had an altar, Lot did not. Altars remind us to pursue our first love. So here's what you're going home with today. Let's not forget the simplicity and the essence of what's in the manger. Do you know, um, there was room in the inn, by the way. I know that for a fact. There was room. But here's the problem. Father, Abba, Papa, he did not want there to be room in the strategies of man. I believe he's the one who said, I got a better plan. Whole different direction here. See, let me tell you kind of how it works. How many of you gave your parents their first grandchild? How many of you gave them their first grandchild? How many of you remember the child who gave you your first grandchild? Your first one. Who gave you the first one, Bob? So Danielle's going to get more money in the will, I'm sure, then, um, for sure. Danielle, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let that be established. You, you good with that? Oh, yeah, she, she's real good with it. She doesn't want to say it. It's okay. Seek first the kingdom of God. Yeah. But, but, but you know what? There's something really cool that happens when that kid comes over for the first Christmas. All four of our grandkids come from Chaz and come from Trish. It's amazing what you can buy for money. And, uh, but neat kids, really neat kids. And you know what? There's times when they're about a year old. Did you ever notice the kids could care less about the gifts? They love the wrapping paper. They love the bows. They love to get in the box. And it's kind of fun. But you know what? You watch this whole thing. I was reading a story a couple years ago in Texas. <laughs> this couple, they've had their first grandchild, and I mean, the parents were elated. They were excited. The grandparents were elated. They were excited. And so here they have this, you know, beautiful child and all these gifts. And how many of you know when the kid's a year old, you get, they get all these gifts they don't even need? 
they'll never even use. And I mean, you're doing it more for the parents and the grandparents, and it's just the whole thing there. And so the parents had, just like you guys have, what do you, what do you call that vehicle you have? Um, what's that? It's, yeah, it's got some Honda van type thing, Majiggy. So anyway, and the whole thing, imagine, was filled with presents and stacked up on the seats and in the trunk and on the floorboards. I mean, they had all these presents. And they, they lived about seven miles away from, their, from the grandparents. No big thing. And all of a sudden, about five miles into the ride, Mama Bear, she screeches. She screams, ah! Honey, what's wrong? We forgot the baby. <laughs> and this Christmas season, let's make sure we um, don't forget the baby. Let's maintain an earthy manger mentality. Do you think Hemet would relate more with the Ritz Carlton or a manger? Maintain a manger mentality. So you go home with this. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Say no to idols. Guess what? Say no, uh, serve others. Always maintain. This is what's kept me going, guys, for 40 plus years now. This is key. Always make sure you have a personal altar. Would you close your eyes for a moment? For some of us here, maybe we're at a place where we're saying, this Christmas season's been incredible. It's been great. But maybe you don't feel that intimacy with Christ you'd like to feel. Or maybe if you're like me, there's all these presents and all the gifts and all this stuff, and it's wonderful. Or maybe it's been Santa Claus, or it's the decorating of the tree, or maybe it's all the dinners and all the stuff we do. But somewhere along the line, you're saying there's got to be something better than this. There's got to be something more to what this Christmas season's about than what I've experienced. And the Jews make the same mistake with Hanukkah. I just want to ask you, how many of you here can accept this simple message? Let's get back to the simplicity of the manger, the baby in the manger. And let's remember, it's all about Christ, who didn't stay in the manger, but he is a resurrected Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. Lift your hand up if you can resonate with that. I want to pray for you. If you're here today and you'd say, man, I love Christmas. It's a great time, but I don't know that I've ever even met this babe. I don't know that I've ever met this Jesus who confounded the wise at 12 years of age at his bar mitzvah in the temple. I'm not so sure I really know this Jesus who at age 33 and a half died for me on the cross. I'm not so sure I really know this Jesus who's seated at the right hand of the Father and is forever making intercession for me. But I really do need Jesus today. Or I need to return to him. Lift your hand right now. I'm just going to pray for you. I'm just going to pray for you. It's the two groups I'm praying for. Just lift your hand. Lift your hand. Let me pray for you as a group. God bless you, man. God bless you. All right, God bless you. See, I almost moved too fast. Can we pray as a church together to encourage these two that have raised their hand? Dear Jesus, I will not forget Jesus. Lord, I want to make sure that I have a personal relationship with you. I declare publicly, I'm a sinner. That just means I missed the mark. And you died for my sins. You are risen from the dead indeed. Seated at the right hand of the Father. And I declare publicly, I have a personal relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, I thank you for our body as a whole. We're saying, man, the lights can rock and the Christmas trees can be so beautiful. And Lord, and we look at this whole season and family coming together. How cool is that? And yet, Lord, we're saying today we want to seek first the kingdom of God, your righteousness. Then you can add the things that need to be added to our spiritual portfolio. We're making this decision today, Lord God, that we're not looking at beautiful buildings today and we're not looking at all these methodologies and just creativity and just excellence. As wonderful as that is, we want to get back to something as simplistic and as basic of remembering that you chose, Father God, by your sovereignty to say, my son, the hope of all eternity will be born in simplicity so that we'll never muddy the waters of who Christ is with all the amenities and civilities and all the add-ons, we simply want to love you, Jesus. 
Thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, and everybody said? Amen. Amen. Love you guys. God's favor is on you. Please do not miss tonight. It's, I, it's very seldom do I do this. It's a certain message that I think I changed the message for tonight. And so poor Trisha has to go and take the outlines and get them all set up there and cut them in half. And so we'll be looking for you. God's favor is on you. Greet a few people before you leave.